Saturday morning. <laughs> I know you're all like, Winnie, stop working on weekends. Um, but I, I couldn't, you know, especially after Walsh's um, announcements yesterday um, with COVID, um, what a whirlwind it has been for the events industry. Um, the ambiguity has been prevalent, contradictory advice, contradictory articles, um, everybody kind of hypothesizing about what they think is happening or what they think should be happening. Um, there's also, you know, making it more difficult. There's minimal precedent um, out there right now as far as legal standards are concerned. There's also minimal industry standard because we haven't been in this long enough for it to um, actually have an established industry standard. Um, I, now I have um, I have spoken with um, retired members of the judiciary um, to try to get kind of an understanding of, of what this would actually look like if anything were to end up in court because um, we can theorize all we want but like ultimately how do you get into the mind of a judge um, and interestingly enough um, just for your own kind of research opportunity if you if you are so inclined and of course I've looked into this as well and can can talk with anybody about any of this but um, what they referred to as far as if there would be any precedent was actually um, after Hurricane Katrina and how all of that was handled now um, that obviously is an entirely different um, um, area of the country their courts operate differently it's a bit more conservative but it does give us a little bit of insight um, so I would you know just kind of have that in the back of your mind as you know if that that is what a judge has told me is something that they may look to if they were looking to, to find any precedent on what's going on so anyway we're here today um, hoping to decipher some of this structure um, however we continue to acknowledge that the laws and guidance are changing daily, um, which is even more reason to have an open dialogue um, with everyone and to, to be a resource for you guys as this progresses. We'll walk through the general guidance today um, and evaluate yesterday's updates by Governor Walls. Um, I encourage you to ask questions through the chat box. If that's something that you want to do, you can send them directly to me or to the group, whichever your preference is. Um, I will kind of Keep it rolling, and then if we, you know, think we get to questions at the end, or or kind of however however is best for everybody, we will approach it that way. Um, I'm going to try to split my screen here so that I can see questions as they're coming in as we chat as well. All right, so um, what we cover today, of course, <laughs> here I am, lawyer hat. Uh, what we cover today is not legal advice, um, as I may not have a client relationship established with each of you yet, um, although it, it actually appears that I do. Um, anyway, we're, uh, rather it's meant for educational and informational purposes. Um, also, please know that we're approaching the education based not only from a business law perspective, but a litigation perspective as well. Um, as many of you know, Jim has spent decades in litigation, strictly litigation, um, and a few of our other team members have been in litigation as well. And the things um, that you hear today uh, may differ from what you've read on blogs um, or hear from legal minds or other business minds um, who don't have litigation experience. Uh, the reason why is litigators think about what actually happens when you get into the courtroom or when you get to the point where you're going through discovery um, because at that point you're getting um, in this area, the zone where now it's kind of lawyer versus lawyer. Um, you're taking out a little bit of that kind of client business interaction um, and you have the legal strategy going into what's happening. And that means like the full, like full garbage, everything, garbage disposal, trash disposal, <laughs> all of it gets dumped into this one pile um, and they throw everything at you so that they can kind of um, have a comprehensive sweep of the situation. So that is how we're approaching our evaluation of what we are looking at. Um, okay, so um, previous to yesterday, uh, weddings have always been clumped in based on what we have heard from the different press conferences and from other guidance. Weddings have always been clumped in in this idea of a social gathering. Um, and that alone would suggest indoors is limited to 10 and outdoors is 25. Up until the point where press started asking questions yesterday, that is also what we thought. Now, <laughs> then a reporter asked a clarifying question, which kind of changed everything, but it's still vague in a sense. 
the reporter asked the question, what happens with wedding receptions? Not the ceremony, the reception itself. And there was this kind of like vague, like general, oh yeah, I suppose in that situation, it would probably be complying with what's happening with other venues. And you would wanna make sure that you're adhering to those restrictions. Um, and that changed everything. So in accordance with that, we would look at restaurants with their maximum 50% capacity, but requiring reservations and social distancing. I don't know how guests would make reservations for a restaurant event, unless it's truly just the client who is making the reservation and everybody else is their guests. But I would imagine that the reservations not only has to do with capacity, but also has to do with creating um, kind of that log of who all has interacted together. Um, so there's some, some ambiguity there, but we do acknowledge that we have restaurants that host events. So that is something to consider. We also have the food element from catering companies. And so, you know, catering companies are not, they're not restaurants, but there is this kind of idea of, well, there's food and there's similar licensing. So would that apply? Then we've got entertainment venues. However, they defined those during the press conference as movie theaters, bowling alleys, um, and other similar venues. Now, movie theaters and bowling alleys are also different than an event venue. However, those are, those are max capacity of 25% and also require social distancing. Then we've got outdoor that's capped at 250 with social distancing. And then moreover, they said in the conference that workers must wear masks in the food-based industries that are customer facing, but the grid itself says that it's strongly recommended, not required. And then we've still got wedding services differentiated on the grid with a max 50% um, capacity with 250 people. And the order itself states that private and public are limited, um, yet the grid just says public. So I've gone through the executive order and we will walk through it. Um, but obviously we've got some kind of am ambiguous language here that addresses different kinds of events that we would be hosting. Um, but I think there's a little bit of a miss here. And I, I think that the, the event industry has been begging for this guidance because um, all of those could play into one event. Um, so yesterday they did state that all of these percentages were based on three elements. The type of contact that exists, the length of contact that exists, and the predictability of contact that will exist at, that, at the event. So we pretty much know, being in the event industry, what type of contact exists in those settings. Now, a big differentiator there is the length of contact. So whether or not you're at a restaurant, or you're at a bowling alley, or seeing a movie, that's a pretty definitive, like, you know, maybe two hours. Um, weddings and events, we're looking at like five to 10 hours, depending on the type of event. So that is a little bit um, uh, misleading as well. Um, and then the predictability of the contact, okay? So, you know, at a restaurant or a bowling alley or somewhere, you know, you can put X's everywhere on the ground, you can kind of say you have to be this far apart. Um, but at weddings, people hug, they dance, like they, they get together. So um, that predictability is unknown as well. The latter two, the length of contact and the predictability, aren't really in the event industry favor. However, I recognize that the government and Walls' office are not intentionally being vague with the events industry. Um, rather, they've got a lot on their plate with the state of our world. Um, and quite truthfully, as we all know, and what I think is maybe actually at play here, is that unless you are in the seat of a vendor, you just don't think through all of the elements to an event or to a wedding. The rehearsal, the rehearsal dinner and or welcome dinner, the prep time during the day, the getting ready hour, the ceremony when applicable, the cocktail hour, the reception, the after party when applicable, thus leading to the confusion and I think the vagueness on, on their part. I, I think they don't realize quite how vague they've been. So I've been talking with a policy advisor in Walls' office um, and have sent 
him a list of questions that ask for actual written clarification on all of these things. Um, being a lawyer, obviously, I want that paper trail. I think that it can be really helpful for our industry. Um, he has said that he has acknowledged receipt of that, and he has said that he is working to get me those answers um, as soon as possible. So he is, he is on that. He knows that we are having this webinar today. He knows that there is a follow-up webinar this week. Um, so that is on his mind. We have, however, spoken with Deed about this. Um, and I have also spoken with, um, I've spoken with some friends of mine who are on the client side of this this year who have also spoken with Deed and they had a similar conversation with Deed that I had with Deed. Now, um, at this point, um, Deed has essentially said that weddings are going to fall under that 25% capacity. So max 25% so long as all of the other guidelines are followed. Um, there is some vagueness around the food side of things and how that would get applied. But at this point, they have said on the phone, not in paper, not in writing yet on paper. So we are waiting for that. But they have said that it would be the 25% capacity if it is this type of venue. Um, for all practical purposes, this would mean that you're looking at your floor plan and you're figuring out the square footage of the communal spaces and then drawing 12 foot boxes and how many of those can fit in that space. That's how many people you can have. So it could actually be significantly lower than what 25% of your capacity could be. Um, or, or it could not, you know, it just depends. But you have to think about it if you've got a six foot difference in every direction. Um, that's going to be what your capacity is at. Now, it seems easy enough. <laughs> like, great, we'll just print it out and there we go. Um, but we have two types of wedding guests and vendors. Um, those who remain concerned about COVID and those who are hopeful it is over and that precaution no longer needs to be taken. You also have the clients who may still assert the various defenses that we've discussed, um, if I've talked with you before, um, because of things such as significant limitations on their perceived event, um, family medical issues, federal guide guidance saying that you know um, they're discouraging unnecessary travel and defining necessary travel um, in their guidelines. And so we kind of need to think through through all of these things. You also have the clients who are going to push the boundaries, right? Because like, you know, the, the, this idea of personal responsibility, um, you know, I'm happy to say that, you know, if I go to Kowalski's um, here in Excelsior, it's like 70% of people are still seem to be taking caution. But then if I go down to the park, it's like packed with people. And so um, the idea of personal responsibility is different in everyone's mind. So, um, we want to um, take caution there as well. Um, and so, so first, we'll, let's address kind of this executive order and the parts of the executive order as it is currently written. I am sure it will be amended next week, but as it is currently written that I think you probably want to take note of in helping to decipher how you're going to um, proceed with your own business and how you're gonna manage the vendor relationships as well as your client relationships and guest interaction at your various events. Um, and then we can kind of get into some other areas that I think are probably are pretty important for you guys um, to consider um, because of the potential ramifications. I think that there's a little bit of unknown um, just because I wouldn't expect that, that you would know this, but kind of the other areas of your business that, that can take a big hit um, if there are violations. And so um, just things that you can do to kind of protect yourself as this, as this starts to open and as these events start to progress. So in looking at the executive order, um, you know, the first thing that I highlighted um, beyond kind of what we've heard already um, were, was the language um, in paragraph three on the second page. Um, and again, I can, you know, j j you'll have this recording if you want it, um, but you can also just kind of take notes um, as to where, where I'm referencing and I'm happy to talk with any of you about it as well. Um, but the third paragraph where it says, um, unpredictable settings are riskier than more predictable settings, large social gatherings for extended time periods increase the risk, risk of transmission is diminished in transitory settings um, that are more limited in duration. The reason why I've highlighted this is it's a little bit um, of this, it's language that goes to the standard that they're using when they're setting their various guidelines. Um, and 
I think that it is important when you are thinking about your COVID policies and how you're drafting things and how you are discussing concerns with clients. Um, because, you know, as we'll see later in, in the order, um, that upon government demand, if there is ever any complaint, you have to um, produce um, your preparedness plan and you know other related COVID documents. Um, and so if you are referencing the governmental language and the standards that they are using and those three factors that I laid out earlier, um, it will undoubtedly help any type of argument that you are making if you do have to talk to the government because you're saying, hey, I listened to you, this is what I did. You know, if they complained, I followed your guidance. Um, and that kind of puts, shifts it back to them a little bit there. So um, that language I would think would be important for that purpose. Then if we get to page four, um, under um, 6A, when it's talking about the guidelines for activities outside of the home, um, just making note that, you know, that um, if they're outside of the home, they need to follow the requirements of the executive order, MDH and CDC, um, and if it's outdoors, also take into consideration DNR. Um, the reason being that I highlighted this is, again, it's kind of those buzzwords that's showing that, hey, I know that I need to comply with these. I'm going to do it to the best of my reasonable knowledge. Um, information is changing daily, but I am proceeding based on what I last learned from these organizations. Um, and it just shows that you're taking that reasonable step. Um, also noting here that the unnecessary travel is strongly discouraged. Um, I, am, I have highlighted that portion of the executive order as well, imagining that this would be a possible argument um, for some of those um, ways that clients are going to try to get out of out of contracts um, citing you know like frustration of purpose if most of their guests are coming in from out of town um, or you know if they're coming in from out of town uh, or if you know there's a key player like their parents coming in from out of town this is an area that you want to just be aware of uh, because this idea of you know telling guests well you know unnecessary travel yes it's strongly discouraged but I'm going to tell you that you still have to do it um, that's more of a public policy perspective that when you are, if you get to the point where you are actually in a debate with people, with your clients, and you are in front of the court, the court is going to look to equity. Um, and the member of the judiciary who I've spoken with has kind of said at this point, like, we're looking to see what's fair and equal, you know, and if you aren't being fair to your clients, then, you know, we're going to fix that. We're going to make it so that it's fair. And you can't ask people to put themselves in, in spots where they don't feel comfortable um, because you're trying to find a loophole. And so I think that it's important to acknowledge what is out there so that you know how to properly prepare responses, um, anticipating that even if this doesn't ever end up in court, which like, let's hope it doesn't, um, if it ends up in front of, um, you know, mediators, um, or if it were to end up even, you know, your response were to end up published like in the Star Tribune or um, on social media, you want to make sure that you don't end up, you know, the next headline story similar to the one out of Denver um, that shows, you know, the event industry as being unreasonable. Um, so making note of the arguments that could be used against you is really, really beneficial um, so that you're making informed decisions moving forward. The next paragraph that I've noted is 6C, and that addresses social gatherings. Now, this is the sense where I could see an instance um, based on the language and based on what has been asked at press conferences that anything outside of the, if we're relying on what was said yesterday, okay, if we're relying on that, um, which at this point we are until we hear further from the actual governor's office from the policy advisor. I would think that there is the wedding service that is covered and outlined under its own section. And then there's now the wedding reception, but things such as rehearsal, uh, rehearsal dinner, um, breakfast to follow, that's probably all still gonna be covered by the social gathering guidelines. Um, again, until we hear otherwise. And that's just based on what it is that they've been actually saying um, versus um, in actuality. Now, 
most of those are going to occur at restaurants. And so then they're going to fall under the restaurant rules. Um, but if you have some type of um, gathering in, in a park, um, a rehearsal dinner in a park, things like that, that's just what you want to at least be aware of. Um, it's, it's unclear at the moment as to, you know, wh how they're differentiating these, um, but something to, to note. Um, next up, we look at um, page five under um, 6C5, uh, weddings, funerals, and services. Now, based on what they've previously said to us, um, again, a bit contradictory with yesterday, but based on what we previously said to us, I would interpret this section to be applicable to the ceremony itself or the service itself. So this area has not changed. This has stayed the same. So this is that you are ensuring a minimum of six feet of physical distance. Um, occupancy may not exceed 50% and then the maximum of 250 people. Here, you're still gonna do your 12 foot boxes to see how many people can fit in the space. Um, and then you're gonna comply there. The trick here is um, the service portion allows for significantly more people than now the reception part does, depending on the size of your space. And so, you know, one thing that I think that is gonna be an important um, decision for you guys to make um, as planners, as venues, you know, and working kind of together in this is coming up with a um, policy or a standard or, you know, a, a question um, that you're gonna ask everybody of, you know, this is what we are currently allowed for reception. This is what we're currently allowed for ceremony. Um, you know, do you client want to invite more people for the ceremony and then have people leave for the reception? Um, usually that's kind of backwards to the way that weddings work. Um, and so, you know, there's also the option of you don't give them that option and you just go with what is allowed for the actual reception itself so that you're not putting people in that awkward situation and you're not being put in the situation where you have to monitor how many people come in and how many people leave. And then when you have to take a proactive measure to tell people that they have to leave in order to protect your business insurance. So um, I, I do think that that's something that needs to be discussed um, in the industry or at least if you are all working on an event together, you've got, you know, venue, planner, um, anybody who would be on site, photographer, videographer, caterer, um, to talk through it for that event and to figure out what you want to do. Um, probably for the sake of uh, working for the betterment of the vendor community, it may be worth coming up with a standard question or a standard policy that you put in all of your documents, honestly, um, so that you don't have somebody saying, well, this vendor said this and this vendor said that, and then all of a sudden you're in a dispute with each other. Um, but I realize it could be different depending on the client, and so you may want to just make sure that your vendor team is all on the same page for each event when it comes to that. All right, so six, uh, page six um, under 7C1 or 7CI, it just refers to um, abiding under 7E of this order. So I've just made note of that because wherever you're in a contract and it refers to another section of the contract, you want to make sure that you're reading both of those um, for consistency as well as compliance. So I just made note of that one section there. On page seven, um, I'm looking now at C3. All right, so here's where we start to get a little murkier. Um, so places of public accommodation, which would otherwise be subject to the restrictions of the executive order, may be exempted from the restrictions if they have been repurposed to exclusively provide services permitted under 7C2. Now, 7C2 addresses um, establishes establishments that offer food, healthcare, crisis shelter, restaurant, and food court. Um, I don't envision that there are any venues that would be repurposed to only serve food and exclude all of the other vendors. Um, the mentality of, 
you know, I'm going to make it work for, you know, the caterer, but the rest of the vendors are out of luck. I don't, that doesn't feel very, um, indicative of our, um, or, or I should say, um, just doesn't feel very, very fair for the way that our industry works. Um, everybody really works well together for the most part. And I think that, um, in this instance, that probably wouldn't apply. But if you do run into that type of situation, um, that is something that you want to consider because you don't want to inadvertently end up in violation of the executive order and now that the penalties of the executive order have been raised. Um, so make sure that you are um, noting whether or not um, somebody is claiming that exemption. Um, under, uh, let's see here, under 7C4, um, places of public accommodation um, are encouraged to offer food and beverage using delivery service, window service, walk-up service, drive-through service, or drive-up service, and to use precautions in doing so to mitigate the potential transmission of COVID, including social distancing. Um, at the same time, they're saying, you know, don't do buffets, don't do kind of bulk food that multiple people are, are getting food from. So I think the caterers, you know, can kind of put their heads together and get creative on this, but um, you're not going to have, you know, delivery service or window service at a wedding unless you're a food truck wedding. Um, and so I think that you want to just figure out kind of how you can maybe replicate these types of things um, while maintaining the vision that the wedding was originally meant to have because that also could give clients an out. Um, so do, do kind of think through that creatively. I know you guys are all creative minds and can come up with some pretty cool stuff. All right. So now we're on to seven C, um, seven C six. Um, and this addresses restaurants. Um, so I know that there are some restaurants who are going to be hosting weddings. Um, at this point, based on what Deed has said, um, that would still fall under um, the restaurant rules. Now, um, I, I wouldn't be shocked if I get um, information back from them that if it is a wedding being hosted at a restaurant, that in fact it would fall under venue guidelines, um, only because of the three factors that they are using as their standard that has to do with um, length of contact, and predictability of contact. Um, when you go to a restaurant, you're going to dinner for two hours. When you're going to a restaurant for a wedding, you're in a very confined space for you know no no shorter than probably four or five hours. So um, that is at the moment they're saying restaurant rules apply. That's what Deed is saying. Um, that may change. So just um, bear with me while we wait to hear back from the policy advisor on that. Um, regardless occupancy, uh, the physical distancing of six feet. So you've got that kind of 12 foot box around each person. So now you're thinking about like your tables and your table setup. Um, and you know, maybe you're at like, you've got your 10 foot rounds or whatever, it's under 12 feet. Um, but you know, if you, it's 12 foot all the way around you. So it's six feet in either direction. So now what you're at like four, four people ish per, um, 10 top. Um, so thinking about floor plans there. Um, in restaurants, workers and customers um, must follow the face covering requirements as, as set forth in the guidance, which you can see on the grid. Um, and then the capacity limitation um, also is um, in effect for um, sale and play of lawful games. So if you end up having any events that include, if it's like a corporate event that includes um, raffles, things like that, this would apply to that as well. My guess is that this is in response to um, Vegas opening up. They wanna make sure that they address that as well here. Next, we're looking at uh, 7C9. This is venues providing indoor events. Um, you know, entertainment, I kind of, disregarded a little bit. Recreation such as theater, cinema, concert halls, museums, disregarded a little bit. But performance venues, um, you know, I would say arguably almost every venue, um, wedding venue is also or has doubled as a performance venue. So this is where I think that they are, that they are allowing the um, venues to be open to 25% capacity. Um, 
they're, they're saying to follow the guidance on the Stay Safe Minnesota website as well, which is that grid, and it's kind of what we've, what we've discussed here as far as the max 25% capacity, um, six feet from every person in every direction. Um, and then it is saying in this instance um, that, you, you, that masks are strongly encouraged. Um, but then you end up with a little bit of contradiction there because if there's food and for the catering portion, there would be masks required, at least on the part of the workers. Um, so it's something for you to kind of um, come to an agreement with as well until we get further clarification from the policy advisors on that. Um, outdoor events, um, same type of thing there. Okay, so, you know, your capacity um, at 250, so long as the guidelines are followed. Um, next, I look to 7E, talking about the non-critical business. Um, pretty much this whole section is going to apply to your worker side of things. Um, and this is when we talk to do a run through of documents you might want to have in place. This is something that you want to pay attention to here. Um, so for the non-critical businesses, this is going to apply for your business preparedness plan. So um, that the government is still requiring work from home whenever possible. Um, they are uh, asking that you ensure that sick workers stay home. Uh, social distancing is followed. Worker hygiene and source is controlled. Cleaning, disinfection, and ventilation protocols are all in place. Um, also for customer facing businesses, which all of these would be, all of our, our um, fields would be for at least those who are on site doing setup or um, execution of the event. Then you have the additional requirements for provisions to keep the public and the work workers safe, um, as well as the enhanced sanitizing, cleaning, and disinfecting regimen consistent with OSHA, MDH, and CDC for all common areas, which in a venue, almost everything is a common area, and so you wanna make sure that you're complying with those, um, and includes signage in common areas to discourage congregating. Um, <laughs> That line is, I mean, it's a little laughable when you think about a wedding or an event because the entire purpose of it is to congregate together. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't, you know, still post signs and then you're taking, you know, reasonable measures in accordance with the executive order um, and, and you're showing that you've taken, you've taken action. Um, then we would go down to um, the uh, page 11, um, 7E7, uh, with training and the requirements for training your team. Um, also, you should be documenting training and having signatures documenting the training that occurred, who was present, and the date that the training occurred for them. Um, also an outline of the training that occurred. This is really for your internal purposes to protect yourself in the instance of a claim against you. Um, it helps protect against claims such as negligence. Um, and then there's um, the requirement to supervise workers. Um, well, it's, it's suggested, so it's not strictly required, but it's strongly suggested that you're supervising workers and ensuring that they understand and adhere to the necessary precautions to prevent COVID transmission. Um, next section addresses compliance, um, which of course you want to make sure that you can um, that you can comply more for purposes of, of your insurance and um, potential lawsuits. Um, and then the next section addresses availability to regulatory authorities and public safety officers. So you are so they said last night that by June 29th you must have a COVID preparedness plan in place. Um, now you don't have to pre-submit that to the governor's office or to deed. Um, however, upon request, any non-critical business must make their plan available to the regulatory authorities and public safety officers, including DLI. Um, and then in addition, if there is any complaint or dispute related to the non-critical business's plan, um, then DLI, DLI is authorized to determine whether the plan is adequate. So this plan is really going to be important because let's say that you have um, you know, a, a guest at a wedding 
um, gets sick with COVID after the wedding and they go to the bride and groom and the, or the bride and bride or the groom and groom. And they say, um, you know, Hey, um, we, uh, you know, we have, we got sick, you know, we think something happened at the event. Um, of course the couple is, is, going to apologize profusely. They're talking likely to a very close loved one. Um, and then all eyes are going to turn to the vendors. Um, and you want to be able to um, prepare for a situation in which you get a complaint about the event. Immediately, it would go to deed or the AG's office or uh, the press. And you want to have that plan in place so that you can defend yourself against those types of allegations. Then lastly, uh, under section 11, um, I found um, this section um, important because it addresses the potential ramifications. So any business owner, manager, or supervisor who requires or encourages any of their employees, contractors, vendors, um, volunteers, interns, et cetera, to violate the executive order um, is guilty of a gross misdemeanor and upon conviction must be punished um, by a fine not to exceed $3,000 or by imprisonment for not more than a year. Um, in addition to the, to the criminal penalties, um, the attorney general and city and city attorneys may seek civil relief, um, including penalties up to $25,000 per occurrence, um, as well as injunctive relief, which would shut you down immediately. And then, um, of course, if um, any individual who is in willful violation of the executive order can be, um, uh, is guilty of a misdemeanor and can be um, punished up to $1,000 um, or imprisonment for up to 90 days. So those are pretty heavy penalties. Um, and not to mention, there is um, the very real concern of your insurance being affected. That's something that I think that a lot of people don't think of, but um, given Jim's background in insurance, it's, he's like the ultimate catastrophist and can think through any situation in that, in that stance and from that perspective. And there are a number of insurers who would either significantly, significantly increase your premium or even potentially drop you if you're willing, willingly um, violating any of these orders and you are caught doing so. Um, so you really do want to be careful there because it could be a situation in which like, okay, all of a sudden you get a complaint from your client or from a guest of the wedding. Um, you are concerned that you're going to be hit with one of these charges. You're going to defend it, but it is something that you have to consider if they are going to report it. Um, so you have to report it to your insurance company and then all of a sudden you're flagged by your insurance company. They're watching you and they kind of decide what to do in that situation. Um, I, I don't, I think in most situations they would not have um, any obligation to, con con to continue insuring you um, if they don't want to. Um, and so you really, that's really important because insurance is key in the wedding and event industry, given the potential damages that are involved and have been involved in past cases. Um, so um, those are sections in the executive order that I have flagged at this point. Now, again, um, I have um, a number of questions in with the um, a policy advisor to the governor to ask for clarification on a few of those ambiguous areas. Um, but I do think that um, at this point, based on what a representative of the governor's office stated last night in the press conference, um, it would be that um, you could be moving forward with the 25% maximum capacity so long as social uh, distancing guidelines are adhered to as well as any other um, government restrictions that are put in place. Now, um, what does all this mean for actually implementing this? So you've got your COVIDness preparedness plan, COVID preparedness plan. Sorry, I heard Teddy coming up the stairs, got distracted there. Um, and um, no matter what, you're going to need to have that by June 29th. Um, it's going to have to be produced on demand. Best just to have it in place. Then there is the internal aspect of this, as well as the client facing aspect of this. So the reason why we look at internal um, has to do with preparing just in case there is ever a claim that is made against you. So it's essentially trying to lay the groundwork to protect you against any type of claim that you should have 
known that your employee was sick, that you were negligent in allowing them to be there, um, because there is definitely a situation in which they may try to seek punitive damages, depending on um, what happens here because of willful and knowing violations. Okay, so um, really, really important to think about this from an internal perspective as well. And most people are like, got it, got my preparedness plan, got my contract, I'm good to go. I'm bulletproof, no big deal. Um, nobody is bulletproof ever. If an attorney tells you that, don't trust them. <laughs> Pretty much any attorney can kind of figure out, you know, loopholes and ways to at least, at least puncture um, a situation enough to get some uh, some groundwork covered, you know. So I really would encourage you to um, just proceed with caution in that realm. So internally, you want to um, have your updated um, employment contractor intern documents, especially with that gross misdemeanor kind of hanging out there. Um, I think everybody's under so much stress right now um, that you will run into situations in which people don't want to go to work um, or they aren't comfortable at an event. And how do you handle those? Um, you want to be building groundwork to pr protect yourself against um, a criminal and civil case that could be imposed in that type of situation. So updated employment, contractor, and intern documents. Um, your updated policies that are affected by COVID. So this is, um, you know, many of you have the, the um, COVID documents that we worked on with you, um, that there's clauses in there, but there is um, an entire employment side of this where um, we put together, it's like, maybe 12 or 14 different worker policies that address COVID. And those are pretty, those are pretty important um, with regards to how you're going to handle situations based on what I'm already seeing um, workers um, calling us with complaints of, to be honest. Um, I haven't had many in the event industry yet because nothing's happening, but based on what I'm seeing in the gym realm and um, some of the other small business realms it is absolutely going to happen for the event industry too. So you wanna make sure that those other policies are also updated. Um, internal preparation for some issues that are predicted um, by attorneys and some uh, retired judiciary in the legal field. Um, you wanna have you know, your business preparation planning for a lot of us. Um, I'm looking through this list here, pretty much everybody on this list you're a key player. You are a key player in your business. And so you want to have um, almost like a, a business succession plan, but it's really a business preparation plan for if you get COVID and you are wiped out, what happens then? Uh, you want to make sure that things continue to run smoothly and that should be part of the um, planning that you are taking before you reopen. Uh, we saw that restaurants reopened and now already six of them um, have closed due to COVID, and so it can happen. Um, make sure that you have that covered. Um, there is um, a, a very real uh, issue that has started to be discussed amongst law firms um, that team members, um, employees in particular, may start claiming um, like PTSD or some type of mental distress as a disability. Um, and then the reasonable accommodations that would need to be made. Um, we are doing a different webinar that, that addresses like just employee and contractor and intern issues where we're really gonna deep dive into that. But that is something to put kind of um, on your mind that that is an issue that we foresee coming up in the employment law realm um, in the next few months for sure. Um, same thing, and this will be addressed in the other webinar as well, but refusal to come to work, lying, um, lying about their health um, because they need to work. So there you have the two differences, refusal to come to work, I'm too afraid, I don't want to, I don't have childcare, um, you can't make me, I can do this from home, we've just proven that, versus um, no, I feel completely fine. Yeah, I had a temperature, not a big deal. It's probably something else. Or yes, I have a dry cough and a runny nose. It's allergies. Um, I need the money. I'm going to come into work. You can't prove that I have COVID. Um, so those are situations that are, that are also going to be very real and you need to take into consideration for um, how you're going to deal with it as it um, directly affects not only the rest of your team, 
but the clients who you interact with um, and you as a business owner. Um, so in line with that, um, it would be your team documents that are in place, um, whether, so it's updated policies that you would want to have in place for your workers, the worker related policies, as well as, um, waivers and, um, any other type of agreement that you would have with your actual workers, whether it's an intern, an employee, or a contractor that, that goes both ways. So that you've got, you know, a disclosure document to you um, that they're signing before every client interaction or every event saying, you know, hey, I don't have COVID to the best of my knowledge. Um, I haven't interacted with somebody who does to the best of my knowledge within X period of time. Um, you know, and to the best of my knowledge, I am ready to work. If for whatever reason I'm misreporting, I accept responsibility. Um, that's not something that you give to your client, but it's something that you keep in um, your file for them so that you have that in the case that, again, somebody comes after you as a vendor, says you were negligent, you sent somebody in here who was sick, and um, we're going to come after you for that. Okay, so that's a really, really important one. Um, you know, the flip side of that also is that they are will, willfully and knowingly going into an event where there will be exposure to many people and they may be exposed to COVID and that they are making that decision to do so. Um, again, that's going to protect you against claims by the actual worker. Um, now, I will say, and this um, just in case there are some of you who, who aren't going to be doing the employment um, documents and webinar, um, one thing I do want to mention is that any documents that are related to a, a worker's COVID status or other medical status should be kept in a separate file than your standard personnel folder. It's for confidentiality purposes and it's actually required by law that you do that. So you need to have your personnel file that has things like their application, um, you know, written warnings, uh, notes of commendation, um, changes to um, pay structure, and then you would have their other file that is purely medical, and that would be confidential and only disclosed to those who absolutely must see it in the course of business. So that would pretty much be you as the owner. Um, and then you want to have checklists internally as well. So once you have your COVID policies in place, let's say that your COVID policy is like, I'm thinking through my daycare. Um, I haven't sent them back yet, terrified to, but is what it is. So I think through their policies and it's like every door is left open, um, even the door to the outside. You know, if somebody is coming in and the door is shut, then you call, they come and open it. Um, and Okay, Kristen, I will get I will get to that in one second. Um, and things like you know that they sanitize surfaces like six times a day, that they take temperatures two times a day. Um, for that policy list, you also want to have a checklist and a checklist that you fill out every time you go through the policy list. Um, whether you're propping a door open or you're sanitizing all hard surfaces, and this this comes from the litigator perspective. This is Jim talking. Um, but you want to make sure that you are also listing on there the, the hard services that you did sanitize to make sure that you truly sanitize all of them. Again, this is an internal document. This is not to be shared with anybody because there is the double-edged sword here of if it is shared with somebody, a litigator could be like, well, you know, you forgot to sanitize the, um, the flusher knob on a toilet, you sanitized everything else, but not that. So they could have gotten COVID from that. So you do want to be careful here. It's what we talk about when we're talking about your client contracts about not being overly ambitious. Um, but do make sure that you are complying with the various regulations and that you're making note of that and keeping that internally to help defend against claims that could happen in the future or if they aren't legal claims, could help prevent against bad press in the future. If you have, you know, some rogue mom who decides that like, you know, she got sick or somebody got sick and they want to destroy you. Um, we've seen it happen. I think we've all seen it happen. And so you want to make sure that you're protected there. Um, okay. Um, we've got a question here. Um, not, uh, not event business related, but I have a studio space with sub renters. When a client works with them for a project in the space, um, does the client have to sign my COVID contracts agreements and the sub renters, or would they be covered under just one or the other? 
what I would do in that instance for any of you guys who are subletting any portion of your space um, to somebody else to host an event there um, or to host whatever or to work out of there, I would have an agreement in place with your sub renter or your subletter or your lessor um, that, um, let's see, excuse me, let's see, um, that, you, that they are accepting full responsibility. So you put COVID policies in place for them that they need to have everybody sign COVID documents. Um, and you can tell them what those are that they need to have them sign. And then they are acknowledging responsibility to have all of those signed every time and that they are accepting full responsibility for anything that happens under any of their people on your premises. And so then that person is liable to you for anything that happens with any of their clients um, work or events or presence on the property. Um, you could you could require that they um, sign your documents as well. Um, it may discourage use of the space. Um, so thinking from a small business owner perspective, um, you know, that's, um, that's a deterrent and everybody's trying to figure out how to make money right now. Um, and if this is another way that you can make money, um, you know, I, I, I understand it. Um, but I think the document that you have in place with your sub renter, um, would, have them assuming full responsibility and liability to you for anything else that were to occur there. Now, let's say that somebody that they have on the premises gets COVID. Likely that person, if they were going to start any type of legal proceeding, would not only start it against um, that individual who you are sub renting to, but would also start it against you as the property owner. That's just, that's just how litigators work. Kind of anybody I can go after, I'm going to go after. Um, and so in that instance, that's where you also want to have an agreement with your sub renter that says that they will indemnify you so that, or, or that they're going to protect you if there's ever a claim brought against you. So that again, the, the, the responsibility for any legal action is still on them. Does that make sense? Um, yes, we can definitely talk through that. Um, absolutely. Yeah, not a problem. Feel free to shoot me an email and we can work on that. All right. Um, any other questions related to the internal side of um, addressing this? Um, remember, there'll be another webinar that um, and I'm happy to send you guys information on it, but there'll be another webinar that goes deep dive into employment and contractor and intern, but is there anything, um, any questions based on what I just said? No? Okay. So then there's the client facing side of things um, for vendors um, and for um, business owners. So um, here is where you're dealing directly with your clients and that would be, oh, um, our employees to sign the doc every time they come in. I would have your employees, um, contractors, interns, assign um, the document um, that pertains to an individual client interaction um, before each new client interaction. So, and that more has to do with like, um, there could be an instance in which they sign it on Friday saying, you know, I, I, to the best of my knowledge, I don't have it. I haven't had any interaction with it. And then Saturday morning, they, you know, are told this happened to um, somebody who was helping me with childcare and is now not, um, that their, you know, stepsister who they just took a picture with um, has been exposed to COVID. And so if you have another wedding that Saturday night, um, you would want them to sign it then. You can always ask them, has there been any change? Um, but best practice would be to have it signed before each new set of client interaction. All right, so client facing, this is where you're gonna have your, your COVID policies that you're willing to share with them to show kind of your preparedness. Um, clients will appreciate that. 
Um, you can also, you know, if you want to, or if you, um, if we get clarification and, and it's confirmed that you're required to have signage up, you may want to put that in your COVID policies because I could very likely see, um, a, uh, a client or the, a parent of a client or friend of a client saying like, I don't want these signs everywhere that says don't congregate. Um, it scares my guests. Um, I, that's very, that's very foreseeable. And so I think having in your policies, your COVID policies that you're giving to them, um, that you're allowed to put up any signage that's required by law or that you feel that you want to put up. Um, under those policies, that's also where you're gonna have, you know, the authority to um, enforce the government restrictions. Again, like, this is not always comfortable to do. And you, you probably won't always do it, but um, considering that your insurance could be affected if you were to be caught at any time, that's where you really want to make sure that you're even you're having some of those tough conversations, um, or at least reserving the right to do so. Um, and so, you know, I would I would encourage that the policies are fairly comprehensive, giving you. A fair amount of authority whether or not you actually choose to um, execute on them although I would encourage you to execute on them just for the future of the event industry and so we don't have a bunch of super spreader events happening um, and you also want the language in there for you to be able to enforce because you know if I don't know a sister shows up and she's peaked and has all of the symptoms you want to be able to have the right to say you know, like she needs to leave and we need to um, clean this premises before we move forward or the event is needs to be done. Um, or, you know, if you ref are refusing to leave, you know, uh, we can leave um, or we can, you know, have you removed. So you kind of want to be able to retain that power um, because it's not just necessarily affecting you. Um, but if you're exposed to it, then you bring it home to your family. Um, you bring it to your quarantine friends, um, you know, and you, you just really don't want to put yourself in a situation where you could be wiped out for the remainder of the season because a guest was not listening. Um, this is another one to, um, for those who, who we haven't discussed the policies with yet, um, there's a pretty important policy um, that I think is, um, um, it, it's pretty relevant um, in that, I mean, I got a message yesterday from a photographer who's shooting a wedding and they showed up and there is definitely more people than was allowed. Um, you want to have something in place that if a client is, knowingly or willfully violating orders, uh, governmental orders, and you choose to stay, um, that they are accepting full responsibility for putting you in that situation. This is going to be important in the sense of if your business is to get shut down um, or under investigation or a complaint against it um, because of an event that you showed up to, to deliver food to or shoot or that you were providing venue for and, um, and they're violating it and you don't feel comfortable leaving. I, I mean, it could shut down the, literally the rest of your season and then you could end up in a lawsuit with all of those other couples. And so that's where you want to make sure that they're going to assume full legal responsibility for that. Um, and I think that we have it written um, in a way that also allows like to cover any legal costs inquiring about the situation. So if it's like, you know, seven o'clock at night on a Saturday and you show up um, to deliver food and there's, you know, I don't know, um, 40 people there, it's clearly below, you know, the capacity, but they're all together and you don't feel comfortable and you need to call me, um, that should cover that. You should be able to bill your client for that. So that's an important policy as well. Um, having your client contracts in place, the updated addendum in place, um, and then the waivers in place as well with your clients. Um, 
So um, kind of one of, I think, the biggest concern that people are going to have is what if you're concerned for your safety at an event? Um, that truly is, is an issue. Um, you know, we're seeing situations in which um, clients are pushing to move forward. Some vendors don't want to. Some vendors do want to. Some vendors feel like they're trapped in a corner and they have to. Um, all of that comes back to your safety. And you want to be able to have, you know, kind of policies in place that you can apply across the board um, and, and, stand, and stand by them. Um, and that your clients would be responsible for any deviation from those or any violation from those. Um, when I say enforcing them across the board, you're also going to want to be careful right now. And I was saying this before the very tragic loss of um, George Floyd and the uprising that has happened since then. But I, I say it now more than ever. Um, you really want to be careful to treat every single client with the same policies and the same procedures and not make exceptions. Um, and if you have to enforce something against somebody to be careful in the way that you're doing it, um, there are going to be discrimination claims flying around in the same way that there's gonna be claims saying that um, your presence gave people COVID. Um, and you really just wanna have a good paper trail of of the measures that you are taking to protect against that and to ensure that everyone is treated the same through your business. Um, I, as you guys know, I've always been a less is more kind of person. Um, but in this instance, um, there are a number of documents that you really do want to have in play and you do want to make sure that you've got very clearly the medical folder if you are inquiring about COVID, the personnel folder um, for everything else. Um, medical folder marked confidential if it's on your computer you know maybe even throw a password on that folder um, just take as much precaution as you can um, don't be afraid to ask questions um, you know please please reach out I would much rather that you ask questions than don't and then end up in a situation that we don't want to see anybody in um, and I would just encourage everybody to, to really work together and to kind of try to come up with um, a broad industry standard um, because everyone is in it together. And, you know, if one or two vendors go rogue and start, you know, forcing things um, to happen or pushing things, you're putting other vendors at risk as well. Um, and you don't want to be in a situation in which you um, inadvertently um delay the true reopening of the wedding and event industry um because we were just eager right now um so as questions come up please reach out ask me um i will send you guys information on the employee worker intern webinar um that is i believe this thursday this coming thursday um and um yeah, uh, you know, as soon as I hear back from the policy advisor, I will send you guys an update with those answers. Right now, we are going forward based on deed, what they've told me, as well as somebody who called in from a client perspective. Um, although the client believes that um, the client perspective, I'm not representing them, I don't take cases against running vendors, but um, the client perspective, um, they're just friends, they, think that Deed thought that they owned a venue. And so Deed was explaining it to them from a vendor perspective as well. Um, so we are going to rely on what Deed has said at this point until we hear otherwise, which would be the 25%, max 25% capacity, adhering with all social distancing guidelines, having the COVID preparedness plan in place, um, and taking precaution. Um, and when there's food related, wearing masks on the side of the workers and encouraging your um, patrons to wear masks and adhere to restrictions as well. Um, we'll continue to address all of this in the coming weeks. Um, I can send you guys information on the other webinars. You know, if, you, if you're at this one, you'll just get the link automatically to the future webinars as well. I envision that not only will the regulations continue to change, but you will end up with clients asking questions. Um, you all have my cell phone. 
Uh, these days, it's like minute to minute. It's just like a circus, as you all know. And so um, if, I'm, if I'm not answering my email right away, shoot me a text. Let me know I have an email waiting. I will get to it, or Brooke will, or my dad will, or Aaron will. Um, we're in this together, and um, we'll just keep updating as we go. So, um, all right. So let me just see here another question. Um, Um, yeah, so I would, um, I, yes, this is good for the COVID policy documents, um, both on the worker side of things, as well as your client side of things, really important to include, um, in there some bold language that says that you have the right to update the information, um, kind of at your sole discretion as, um, I, I don't know if it would be as more information becomes available um, because you may just decide that what you're doing is not working and you may want to shift it. But I would say that, you know, you are reserving the right to update or amend um, any of your um, preparedness policies um, at your sole discretion. I would put that in bold on the bottom of, um, or just as a line item, even at the top of your um, of your policies that you're going to have your client or your worker sign. Any other questions related to this stuff for today? <laughs> you're welcome. All right, guys. Well, if anything comes up, feel free to shoot me a message. Um, if we're going to talk through something specifically, um, we can do so uh, after this or early next week. And until then, I hope that you guys have a good weekend. Be well and um, keep fighting the good fight for our wonderful community. So bye.